Today I'm going to make a modern round coffee table with drawers. The build is mostly made out of plywood and I'm going to test out a couple of ways of cutting out the shapes that I need. But first, the design. It seems very simple. It's just two cylinders of different sizes stacked on one another. But what makes this a challenge, there are two draws that will follow the curve of the top cylinder. In order to do this, the top section is going to be made up of six pieces of plywood the round base, the top outer curves, the long dividers, and the short center divider. Since I designed this on the computer and already had the digital files, I figured this was a good opportunity to play around with the shaper origin and see how it does with cutting out large pieces of sheet goods. I told you guys I would give you my honest opinion about this awesome tool, and I have to say, I do not like using it to cut out this large circle. Here I'm cutting out the top outer curves and the main round base. The top outer curves made sense to cut with the origin because they are a unique shape, but cutting out the main large circle would have been way quicker with a regular router and a plain old circle cutting jig. One pass on this large circle took longer than I expected, so I cut out the rest with a jigsaw and then cleaned everything up with a flush trim bit at the router table. This was way quicker than needing to take multiple passes on these large shapes with the origin. I still love the origin. I think the perfection that I get when using it on smaller projects cannot be beat, but I don't plan on using it to cut out large, simple shapes on sheet goods anymore. I'm glad that I tested it out though, and now I know. So the bottom portion of this table will be made up of two rings, which I cut out using the tried and true method of a circle cutting jig and a router, and this took no time at all. Sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution. All the circles are cut, moving on to the dividers. I ripped two pieces of plywood to width, and this will determine how tall the upper section will be, and I was aiming for about six inches here. The ends of the dividers need an angle cut on them in order to match the curve of the circle, and I have no idea what that angle is, and I don't care. I marked it with a pencil and adjusted the miter saw until the blade lined up with the mark. I cut it and made sure it was flush and repeated the same thing on the three other sides. The top outer curves are going to be connected to the base using two by four supports. I'll use the actual plywood pieces I cut to get the height of all those supports and cut them at the miter saw using a stop lock. While I was at it, I also cut the 2x4 supports that will connect the rings for the bottom portion of the table. I hope you could somewhat see how this thing is going to come together now. Just one more piece to cut, the short center divider, which is made up of two pieces cut to the same length. All right, everything is cut. Time to assemble it. Since this is all plywood, I'm going to use glue and screws. Pretty simple and straightforward. But to make it even easier on myself, I pre-drilled and made countersunk holes using a countersink bit before locking it all down with the screws. The order of assembly on all my projects is something that keeps me up at night. And this is what I came up with here. If I flip the outer curves and the long dividers upside down while attaching them, it would ensure that the tops of them remain flush. So that's what I did to both sides. Then I glued and brad nailed the two short center divider pieces together to make one thicker center divider piece and glued and screwed that in place while everything was still upside down, making sure it was all nice and square. Now that whole assembly can be flipped right side up and the two by fours I cut earlier slip right into place and they could be locked down with screws through the top. This whole assembly needs to be attached to the main round base. So I clamped it up and flipped this whole heavy assembly upside down. Easier said than done, by the way. And I started by screwing the two x four supports to the bottom while it's all clamped up, and then marked out where all the plywood dividers are and locked it down with a ton of screws. And the carcass for the top portion is done. Moving on to the bottom section. This section is way simpler because there are no draws. It just consists of two plywood rings screwed to the two by four supports. So if you wanna make a solid round coffee table without draws, it would be a lot easier. What I just created with the plywood and two by fours looks pretty ugly, so it needs to be covered up. This is going to be done in stages and the top and bottom sections will get different treatments, but the base layer on both parts will be pretty much the same. This is Bendable plywood. You've seen me use this stuff on my channel before, like on my curved plywood chair video, and this is a perfect application for it. 
After ripping the pieces slightly oversized, I knocked down all the high spots on the 2x4 supports for the block plane and glued the bendable plywood to the frames I constructed. I used brads to hold the shape as the glue dries and I'm not sure if it's necessary or not, but I added screws into the 2x4 supports as well. Can't hurt, right? The top portion was done pretty similarly, except I added a second layer of the bendable plywood with glue to make it a bit more solid, since I figured this part will be banged up by my kids a little bit more. Then I filled all the holes and tried to make the surface as smooth as possible for the veneer that I will add later. All right, this part is about to get a bit crazy. <laughs> I left the bendable plywood long into the draw cavity and I needed a way to flush it up on the inside faces. So I'll make a jig. So for the base, I used scraps from cutting out the circles that followed the contour of the table and tack them on a flat base. The angle of that flat base wasn't quite right for making a square cut on the edges. So I cut out some angled pieces from some more scraps on my tapering jig and attach those to another flat base that I could then tack onto the curved base that I made before. Told you it was gonna get crazy. I took some more of the bendy ply and tacked that to the inner curve of the jig. This will rest on the curve of the table and the excess protruding out the sides enables me to clamp this crazy thing to the table. Last thing the jig needs, a fence that a router can ride along and it's ready to be used. I put a straight bit in the router and just kept plunging until the excess bendy ply was cut away from the edge. You can see how the jig sits nicely on the curve because the bottom and the middle angled section increases the cutting angle of the router so that the bit is almost parallel to the divider piece that makes up the inside of the draw cavity. This cut didn't need to be perfectly square to the divider piece and you could see I'm actually cutting into said divider piece because I plan on adding hardwood edging to the section anyway. These corners seem like they would be susceptible to getting dinged up on my kids, so I wanted to make sure that they were as strong as possible. Anyway, to fill the edges with hardwood, remember I said my jig was cutting almost parallel. I used a square to mark a straight line stemming from the plywood divider on a piece of white oak, then adjusted the table on my bandsaw so it looked like it lined up with the angle of that line. And then I cleaned it up with a block plane until everything was looking nice and flush. I roughly trimmed most of the excess off the top of the pieces, then glued them into place using painter's tape as clamps. Once dry, I used a block plane to flush it up to the bendable plywood and sanded the rest of the table smooth to prepare it for the veneer. But before I could do the veneer, I need to make the draws. Since the draws are curved, I'll need to make bending forms. Now, this is the perfect application for the origin. This is one of those cases where a circle jig could also be used, but it would have taken longer because there are multiple setups required. This took no time at all with the origin, and I only had to cut out the shapes one time then I could use those shapes as a guide to build up the rest of the form. I already made a whole separate video on how I made these curved draws if you want to see more details about this whole process. So I'll just gloss over it on this video. Using the bending forms I just made, I laminated a bunch of strips of bendable plywood to make two parts of the draw, the inner front and the outer front, and repeated this twice so I had four parts in total. Now it's time to veneer everything. I had this white oak veneer left over from when I built my no weld bookshelf bench a while back. Just like in that project, I used contact cement that's specifically formulated for paperback veneer, which is what this veneer is. You apply it liberally on both parts, wait for it to dry about 20 minutes or so, then apply the veneer to the work pieces using a scraper to make sure there's good adhesion. Now that the veneer is applied, the bendable plywood layer on the table could be trimmed but I felt that using a regular flush trim bit on my trim router would be a little unwieldy since the surface isn't flat. So I used my six in one trim router jig where one of the features allows you to safely trim edges just like this. The router base stays flat on the surface towards the inside of the table and there's another piece on the underside of the jig that runs along the outside of the table which prevents the router from tipping outward. When cutting, I set a straight bit so that it's just the hair's thickness above where it's supposed to be so I can just clean it flush with a block plane and I find that I get cleaner results this way. 
I lost count on how many times I flipped this table over, but I flipped it and repeated the same process to the top. Working off the actual depth of the table, I could trim the draw parts to size. The draw fronts were really satisfying to trim on the table saw like this. But remember, I have a whole separate video where I go into detail on making these draws. Also note that the weather has been getting colder, so my attire has changed. Throughout this video, it was warm enough for me to work in just a sweatshirt. Sweatshirts from Area at Work to be exact. The Rebar Skill Set Half Zip Hoodie is my new favorite and it's loaded with features. Just like everything from Area at Work, their sweatshirts are designed to handle the toughest work environments. They're soft, warm, easy to move in, and this Rebar Hoodie even has a water repellent finish. One of my favorite features though is this hidden media pocket inside the main pocket so I can keep my phone protected in there while I throw tools in the main pocket. But now it's gotten cold enough that I need to add a layer and the Rebar Dura Canvas insulated jacket is the perfect lightweight solution for anyone who needs to stay warm while they work. This will be my second winter sporting all this area work gear to keep me warm while I work and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness behind all of their designs so I can actually get some work done out here. Check out the link down below to get 10% off your first order and check out the link to my favorite items where you can see the sweatshirts, jackets, and other things that I love from Area at Work. Back to the draws. Using a slot cutting bit at the router table, I made grooves in the bottom of all the draw parts to hold the draw bottom that I ripped to width, then it shaped the front to match the curve of the draw, and made a rabbit all the way around it so it fits in the grooves that I cut on all the parts. I pre-drilled and countersunk holes on the sides to make it easier for assembly, then assembled both of the draws using glue and screws through those holes. That was a pretty quick summary, but remember there's a whole separate video with a ton of details. To hide the screws, I made some plugs using a plug cutter and glued them all in place. While I was at it, I also filled the holes inside the draw cavity with the plugs, and it's always fun to cut these flush. The draw slides that I'm using for these draws are push to open slides. In order for them to function correctly, there needs to be space to push the draw front into. So I used a makeshift trammel from the center point and marked out an arc by the draw openings that would be enough space for the draw to open, and then I rough cut it with a jigsaw. Sometimes people ask me, what do I do with all the jigs that I make for my projects? Well, I try to reuse as many parts as I can. The jig I used to make the rabbits on the draw fronts had the perfect curve to use as a template to clean up the rough jigsaw cut. Just a little chisel work to square up the inside corners and it's good. Time for finish. I'm going to stain this all black. So I filled in any holes with tintable wood filler and sanded everything clean. I decided to go with India ink here. It's a pretty simple finish, but there are a few things to deal with. It's water-based, so it will raise the grain. I apply one coat, let dry, sand with 220, apply a second coat, then add the top coat. I went with a satin spray lacquer because it's what I had and India ink doesn't do well with wipe on finishes. It tends to rub away, so you definitely wanna use a spray. Now for the base. I'll clad it with brass sheets. I line them up on the base, mark it off, and then cut it to length with a circular saw. Since the brass sheet is very flimsy, I sandwiched it between two sheets of plywood to stabilize it while making the cut, and this worked out really well. To apply the brass, I used contact cement. This time a sprayable version, which I used successfully on previous brass sheet projects. Once both parts are dry, simply lay it on. Usually calls or spacers are required to hold the material up and prevent it from sticking where you don't want it to stick, but the round curve of this was perfect for applying. The brass sheet was a bit oversized, so I used a flush trim bit in the router to flush it all up. Yep, you can use regular router bits on brass. It works great, except my shop is covered in brass shavings now. I'm sure some of you may have asked yourselves, what about the seams? That was actually my biggest concern on this build, and I think my solution was a total fail, but I'll share it anyway. I thought maybe I could fill in the seam with brass powder and super thin CA glue, and then just sand it down and it would blend. Spoiler alert, it didn't. But the sanding process for the brass is pretty simple. I wanted a brushed finish, so not super shiny. This type of finish is just more kid-friendly when it comes to fingerprints or scratches, and it's easier to do. 
The trick is to move only in one direction. I started with 220 grit and found that it cut better when I used something to lubricate it like WD-40. Then I just went around the whole base over and over again with higher and higher grits until I got to probably 600 grit. And then on the last pass, I used four out steel wool and put a layer of paste wax to finish it. I like to use Renaissance wax. One last feature I haven't even touched on yet is the top. I cut out a piece of MDF using a circle cutting jig and prepped it for an epoxy pour. I wanted this top to look like this piece of marble. So I did some experimenting. I'm actually going to do a whole separate video on how I was able to get this effect. So look out for that in the coming weeks if you're interested. I think it's pretty cool. All right, let's wrap this thing up. I drilled holes in the top of the base turned the top portion upside down, placed the base in the center, making sure it was even all around and locked it down with screws through the underside. Then I could flip the whole table right side up and install the drawers. Using a plywood spacer and a combo square, I screwed all the slides to the inside walls of the draw cavity, then placed plywood spacers underneath the draw to lift it up a bit while screwing the slide to the side of the draw. I used a combo square again to make sure these were placed correctly. I make sure to use the elongated holes so there's room for adjustment after attaching the draw front, which is what I did next. Clamped it in a good spot, then locked it down with screws from the inside. I could glue the top down, but I want to be able to keep my options open in the future. I may get sick of this and want to swap it out for something else. So I use L brackets inside the draw cavity instead, and it's done. This was a challenging build for sure, but totally worth it. I think it looks so cool, and I love the functionality of having these two huge draws in this space. I love the brass, and as I mentioned earlier, blending the seam was a fail, but it's not too bad. Maybe I should have welded it before applying it on the base. I'm really not sure, but it still looks cool, so I'm happy with it. I also had some issues with the faux marble technique, but I'll talk more about that in the more detailed video that I'm going to do on that. Overall, this table was a success and I got to learn a ton and that's what it's all about. So a huge thank you to Area Work and Woodcraft for sponsoring this video. And thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you on the next one.